Hello everyone, good afternoon, good morning. Welcome to this new webinar of our guest webinar series. It's been a while we've not, we've, we've not been online with you, so, so it's a pleasure to, to get back on stage with you all. Uh, today, uh, our guest speaker is Pierre Filodo from Total Energies. Pierre is a business modeling specialist and is speaking live from Paris in France. And uh, today's presentation is about uncertainty and risk analysis in basin modeling using an example from Eastern Mediterranean. So welcome. If you can move to the next slide, I see it. Welcome. Thank you all for being with us. We hope you will enjoy this presentation. So, so as I was saying, uh, Pierre-Yves is uh, our guest speaker, but this, uh, this session is a bit uh, specific as we, we will also have a first uh, part uh, by Alcid uh, that will give an introduction um, on the technology that, that has been used uh, in this work. And my name is Marie and I will moderate this session. So before we start, let me give you a short introduction of Pierre-Yves and Alcide. So Pierre-Yves received his master's degree in geology from the University of Rennes in 2007 and uh, his PhD in earth sciences from Thierry and Marie Curie University in 2011. He joined BASIP in 2012 as an exploration geologist specializing in basin modeling. And since 2018, Pierre is part of Total Spectrum System Evaluation Team. His professional experience includes stratigraphy, tectonics, and basin analysis in fallen, passive margin, and um, intracratonic settings. Alcide uh, is a basin modeling expert at BASIP. He's been working with us for 10 years after a master's degree in geophysics from EOST and a master's degree in petroleum geosciences from IFP School. Alcide was previously in charge of the developments of uh, our software solutions for petroleum exploration, and he is now involved in developing uh, innovative workflows using these technologies to tackle exploration production challenges. So uh, thanks again for being with us. A um, few guidelines about the meeting. So you are all automatically muted. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the questions panel that is located uh, on the right. Uh, we'll have a break uh, after uh, Alcide's presentation, and we also have a break at the end of, the, of Pierre's presentation, so we can answer all of your questions live. If we don't have the time to do so, we will answer them afterwards by email. There is also a polls tab at right hand side where we will ask you some questions from time to time. So please have a look. And uh, finally, all of this session is recorded and uh, we will uh, post it, post the video on our YouTube channel in a, in a couple of days. All right, so let's start. Uh, first, we'll have an introduction to the Cougar Flow technology, a focus on a brand new module uh, for map analysis. And then we'll move with, we'll move with Pierre-Yves to um, an application of this technology on, uh, on Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you, and I see the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marie, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. So let's start by introducing Google Flow and actually why we need to take into account uncertainties in our basin models and how to properly handle them. So why do we need to handle uncertainties in basic modeling? Well, as you all know, I'm sure for now, by now, but it's always nice to mention it again, is that basic modeling is a deterministic approach and it is validated. Each simulation is validated through calibration points. So for example, uh, your well data, your non-accumulations, and so on. So actually, the solution is not unique, and you may have several models that will uh, respect your calibration data, that will match your calibration data, and that will actually give various answers as you move further away from the calibration data. So already here, you have a variability. You have an uncertainty on your models. And actually, that in uncertainty is introduced at all levels. So the purpose of basin modeling is to represent the geological reality, uh, what happens within our basins through uh, millions of years, and all that is represented through geological concepts, so that are not perfect and we, we cannot take all of them into account. 
these geological concepts are translated into numerical model uh, formulas and these also are simplified of course they do not represent exactly uh, what happened and then we also have our model parameters so everything we put in the model so at present day which is sometimes a bit uncertain and also in the past which is even more uncertain and all that uh, brings uncertainty in the models so traditionally several methods are used to take that into account but they are usually not compatible with the industry timelines and expectations so the first way of dealing with the uncertainty can be oversimplified, which is to take into account a reference model with uh, some alternative scenarios, best case, worst case scenarios. So actually to illustrate that, I present here a slide from a previous presentation I've done at the Hedberg conference in Mexico City in 2020. Uh, the slide is relatively nice with the reference case. Some uh, examples, if we test various chirogens, if we test various values for TOCs, so it gives you an idea of what you can get, but there is no quantification. There is no probability. You don't know which model is the right one, and you don't know if you have tested everything. So actually, yes, it gives you a qualitative idea, but there is no quantitative idea, and you don't know everything that is possible. And there is another approach, which is on the other hand of the spectrum, which tends to be a bit time wasting, which is the Monte Carlo approach with thousands of simulations, which is illustrated here in a figurative way, which is performing 1,000, 10,000 simulations uh, in order to really test everything. But when you do that, actually, you need days, sometimes months to actually run everything. And usually we don't have time to do that. So here uh, we try to bring the solution for that with a cougar flow approach uh, and we hope that that solution uh, can answer uh, that problematic so cougar flow is a response uh, surface modeling uh, software so that uh, so, so sorry that will uh, try to bring as well as possible um, a good uh, uncertainty management. So how does it work? So we build a responsive phase from a limited number of simulations, and that responsive phase will mimic the calculator behavior and will allow for a quick and quantified sensitivity and risk analysis. So in detail, let me uh, try to present as well as I can the, the, the methodology for you to understand how it works. So the first step will be to define your uncertain parameters. So these uncertain parameters will depend on the objective of the work that you're going to do. So for example, if you study the maturity of the source rock, it could be the basal heat flow and the activation energies of the source rock. If you study pore pressure, it can be the permeabilities and the capillary pressure, if, et cetera, et cetera. So these parameters and their variability will depend on the objective. So here we define two of them and we define how they vary. So from a minimal and maximal range that comes from your geological knowledge or from your observations within the basin. And you also give a distribution that will depend on the probability for each value to actually occur. So either, for example, normal distribution where you emphasize uh, the reference value and you say that the minimum and maximum are not possible or uniform law where everything has the same probability of occurring. Then from these distributions and these uncertain parameters, uh, Cougar Flow will uh, define what we call an experimental design, which are the simulations that are used in order to properly um, describe the uncertainty space. So how does that work? So here we have the variation of the first parameter, the second one. So from that distribution, we sample the space and we select, for example, three values uh, for them so that are closer to the center here because it's a Gaussian trend. For the second parameter, we define three of them as well. And by combining them together, that gives us, in this example, nine simulations that needs to be launched in order to properly understand uh, the, the variability of the model. Then we actually launch these simulations. So we run them and we study what we call the response. So a property, a result uh, from that simulation that we want to analyze and characterize. So for example, the transformation ratio of a source rock or the pore pressure within a reservoir. So here, each simulation that is launched, first we need to make sure that they are 
okay, they, they are acceptable and we need to make sure that the calibration is okay. So in temperature, vitrinites, uh, that the, in pressure, that the accumulations are properly represented. And if it is not the case, well, we need to, that, that means the uncertainty space is too big. And that means we need to reduce uh, the, the variation of our, of our parameters. So, but if they are properly calibrated, uh, that means that all the simulations are possible and we can uh, extrapolate in between them. So this is actually what we do when we build the response surface. So we build that response surface through a Krieging method. So we respect all the simulated points and we interpolate in between the points uh, through a Krieging method. So we need to make sure that that response surface is actually correct and predict uh, well the model. So for that, we use what we call confirmation runs. So simulations that are not used to build the response surface. And we check that the response coming from the response surface and the response coming from these confirmation runs match. If it is the case, which means that we have a good predictivity, we can actually perform our sensitivity and risk analysis. So how do we do that? Now that we have a response surface, we perform our Monte Carlo sampling approach to 10,000, 100,000 uh, points that are projected onto the response surface and that give us 10,000, 100,000 values. So that is actually done almost in instantaneously, just in a few seconds, because it's just extracting the value from the response surface. And from that, we get the distribution that gives us the variability of the model and the variability of the response. So actually we have several types of results. So the main ones are a sensitivity analysis, which will tell us from all the uncertain parameters that we have defined, which one has the biggest impact on the response. So which one makes the response vary the most. So that allows us to know which uh, parameter we need to focus on. Um, and then we also can perform a risk analysis, which gives us what I showed here, the variability of the response and what is the most probable values. Uh, so the P10, P50, P90 uh, values uh, in, in that case. So traditionally, Kugel Flow uh, was working on scalar responses or pseudo-well responses. So what are they? So a scalar response is just a value either within one cell or a value for a group of cells. So for example, the average pore pressure in a reservoir or the total accumulated hydrocarbon masses within the reservoir. And so the graphs that we had were usually a Pareto plot. So for the sensitivity analysis, so we knew which one was, which parameter was the most impactful or the distribution. So P90, 90% chances of being above P50, P10. And we had the same thing. So that arrived in 2020, the same thing for pseudo wells. So for an analysis uh, over the entire sedimentary column or along a tentative well trajectory. So here as well, we had a sensitivity analysis. So we were able to know which parameter was the most impactful at the top of the model or at the bottom of the, of the model. And we also had uh, a P10, P50, P90 uh, trend along the well. So that is great, for example, for pore pressure prediction. So before drilling, we know uh, what uh, overpressures to expect uh, inside uh, the basin. So that also gives us a very nice um, uh, information in order to uh, anticipate what is going to happen. So when we drill, if we follow a certain trend, uh, we are able to kind of anticipate and, and see how it's going to behave uh, deeper. So, sorry, so what I forgot to say is that these uh, informations were already very nice. Uh, these responses, scalars, or pseudo wells were um, actually very interesting, but limited uh, when we wanted to study the whole basin. So they were limited spatially, and they tend to be not suitable for a full exploration study when we want to to know the information over the entire basin because it forces you to carry out several uh, analysis uh, over the, the basin, which takes a bit of time. So actually, this is uh, why we developed a new map analysis module within Google Flow that becomes available in this uh, 2021 version of OpenFlow Suite. So the R&D behind uh, the um, the, that new module was actually developed at uh, IFPEN. So 
by our uh, researcher team and the development and the integration of the development within the, the software was sponsored by Total Energies. So how does that work actually? So from all the, from each simulation, we extract uh, a map. So we either take the map for one unit or for a sequence of the model that we stack onto uh, one map. So that gives us uh, four maps, nine maps, for if we take the example uh, before. These maps are understood uh, through, are interpreted through a principal component analysis. So they are described with basis functions. So we say they are the, 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 the sum, the combination of several basis functions. And we build one response surface for each of uh, the basis functions. So that gives us, uh, for example, here if we decompose it in two uh, functions, that gives us two response surfaces uh, to describe the entire map. So we don't have one response surface per cell, but we have a limited number of response surfaces for uh, the entire base. And then we validate the response surfaces the same way. And from these response surfaces, we can build uh, our map results, so either sensitivity maps or uh, risk maps. So I'm going to present you that right here in more details. So as I said, we analyze a new type of object. So it's no longer a scalar or the well, but it's a map of interest. So we extract it uh, in the model. So for example, here we have extracted the age at peak expulsion from a given source rock in uh, the model. So a deep source rock in the model uh, where we have computed uh, the age of explosion, so which corresponds to the transformation ratio at 50%. So we see that we have some mature areas, less mature areas. We build our response surfaces. We get two informations for the response surfaces, so the Q2, so which is the predictivity from the confirmation runs. And then we have the Q2 conf, which is the predictivity uh, from the, so the constructive run, sorry, for the Q2, and the Q2 conf from the confirmation runs that are not used in order to build the response surface. And here what we see is that we have a quality that varies uh, spatially that we can understand. So we know where we really trust the model, where there is maybe a, a poor quality. We can also see that the quality depends on the standard deviation. So on the way the model varies, and usually where we, you have a poor predictivity, it's, this corresponds to areas where you have actually uh, almost no uh, variation so that means that you can actually uh, trust the model still because the, the, you always predict the same, the same value. So here you can understand that and you can check the quality very uh, spatially. Then you perform your analysis. So what you're gonna get is first the results for your global sensitivity analysis to understand the effect of each parameter. So you will have one map per uncertain parameter. So to understand for each parameter, how the impacts vary uh, spatially and how they are varying compared to each other. So for example, here for the source rock maturity, we see that it's the reactivity of the source rock, which is the main uh, factor. Then we have the heat flow, which has, which has a quite homogeneous uh, behavior over the, the model. Uh, then we have here the velocity model behavior, and we see that here the impact uh, varies more laterally, and that it's actually where we are deeper in the model that it has the strongest impact. And here the paleobathymetries have almost no impact on the source rock maturity. And all that can be combined into one uh, map, which is a global map showing the main effect. So laterally, you know uh, that, for example, if you have an accumulation, so if you have a block in that area, the main element you need to focus on is your source rock reactivity. So whether it's more type two, type three source rock. And actually, if you are more in that area, you see that what you need to focus on is more the velocity model. So the depth, the actual depth of the, of the source rock within your model. And that would be more the critical element uh, to characterize the maturity of the, of the source rock. Then you can uh, also get new results, which are a risk, uh, your risk for the model. So you get your P10, P50, P90 maps. So your, uh, I would say here, the value for which you have 10% to be above. And in that case, we see that the most risky is to have a model that is uh, over mature with a very high, uh, with a very early expulsion uh, timing. The P50, so 50%, which is usually our best guess, uh, best guess scenario, which is uh, 
an expulsion ranging from 50 to 100 million years where we are mature. And here a P90 where we see uh, actually some areas that are a little bit mature. And all that can be also translated into what we call a probability of success map, where here we are going to check the probability of having the age at peak exposure that occurs late enough, so actually after the fact that the reservoirs have been deposited. And here actually the, that results, it's another way of seeing the information. So where we see where we are sure that the peak of expulsion occurred after 92 million years. So here we see that some areas uh, are very promising and others actually we may have an exclusion that occurs too early, areas that are over mature and um, so that are actually a bit risky in that case. These probabilities can be uh, coupled, associated to properly understand them because here we see that we uh, expel early enough, but do we expel actually enough? Uh, so here we check as well the probability of having a transformation ratio over 70%, which means that the full potential of the source rock uh, almost has been uh, expelled. So almost all the hydrocarbons from the source rock have been expelled. We see here that actually the, it's a bit uh, more limited compared to, to this one. And if we combine the two of them, this is actually the full global probability of success for the scenery source rock. So we can combine uh, probabilities where here we... Uh, obtain the, the final uh, risk for this deep source rock. Of course, there are other source rocks in the model that we can uh, take into account for other analysis, but here we have uh, our analysis over the entire area at once within one single uh, analysis where we only launch a few simulations to get to that result. Uh, this concludes that introduction uh, on the methodology uh, and the, the results that we can get. I don't know if there are uh, some questions. Looks like no. <laughs> You'll have time to ask questions afterwards if needed, so no worries. So Pierre Yves, if you're ready, uh, you can yes, share your me, slides. Uh, just share my screen. Okay, so now it should be okay for everybody. It's fine. We see we see your slides. Okay, so uh, I will present you um, uh, a use case uh, of this new module I see the, just described before, and it uh, will be applied to Eastern Mediterranean. So I uh, start uh, by thanking the, the team uh, from this uh, region to uh, let me present uh, this case. Um, okay, so you already presented me, but uh, just in case uh, for people not knowing me, uh, you have here some uh, links to, uh, to 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 join me in the in the social network. Uh, so as you said, I've been uh, working in uh, in Basic Front Lab for a couple of years, and uh, since uh, three years from uh, from now, I've been uh, working in in, uh, in total ener no total energies. So um, I have been appointed specialist, uh, which means that I'm. Um, uh, a reference in the group uh, for coaching the junior and uh, and training uh, new people for this uh, petroleum system modeling topic. Um, you see on the map uh, some uh, some basin I've been working on. Uh, so it's mostly on the Atlantic margin, but uh, but uh, today we will focus on this uh, Eastern Mediterranean uh, region. So the context and objective uh, for this study, um, so East Mediterranean, uh, for uh, for people who don't know this basin, uh, it means uh, major gas discoveries. So you have, uh, you see here the map, uh, an extraction from the main field in this area, and you have uh, various plays. Uh, some are mature, some are, some are more emerging. And you see that you have, uh, in those cases, uh, the Nile Delta with the uh, biogenic gas from uh, Oligocene to Pliocene Reservoir. Uh, you have biogenic gas as well in uh, some uh, Cretaceous carbonates around uh, the Eratosthenes Seamount. And uh, the famous, uh, as well, the famous fields in, uh, in the Levantine Basin, uh, in the Miocene Sandstone, the Tamar Sandstone field, uh, as well with biogenic gas. Um, these basins, there are still some areas uh, poorly explored, and um, and uh, this leaves also a door for some new plays. 
So this is where uh, comes our questions and, and the, the main challenge of this study is uh, to get a better uh, understanding of uh, the biogenic gas kitchens. Where are they? Uh, when are they functioning? Uh, are they still active or not? And uh, in that frame, we are based, uh, this study is based on this uh, famous uh, Clayton paper and, uh, and the more recent uh, modifications done by Schneider et al. Um, so um, for people who are not familiar with this, uh, this author defined the biogenic window as an envelope um, in terms of heating rate, so the, the way, the, the, the speed at which you, you heat your sediments after the deposition. And it's defined um, in this window between seven degrees per million year, between 18 degrees per million year. So below that, you don't have potential. Inside of that, you have uh, the full potential. And on top of that, uh, it's still uh, questionable. And of course, uh, as I said before, you have to deal with that uh, at the time of deposition. Um, here you have an extraction uh, of the heating rates computed in the in the model we are we are using, and you see that uh, it's widely distributed uh, from this uh, no no potential to uh, the biogenic window, and some points are as well on top of that. So the question is, um, in that case, how can we move from uh, this area to this or to downward or uh, even uh, even upward? Uh, other questions and uh, still uh, without answer in this uh, part of the world is uh, the likely distribution of uh, thermogenic source rock and, and the maturity distribution. So in that case, uh, we will focus on um, uh, this model, which uh, we will focus on the Eocene to Miocene interval, but uh, of course the, the model has, uh, has simulated all the sedimentary column from the basement to the surface. And we are dealing with a quite uh, small grid with 17,000 uh, cells in, in each model. Um, so why focus on biogenic and, uh, and why this question is important in the, um, in the Eastern Mediterranean domain? Uh, it's important for our uh, acreages uh, and exploration, but as well for, for the de decision-taking process. And what we need to understand is uh, quite simple. We need to know if uh, the biogenic sources are in the favorable generation window. So the, the biogenic window I presented in the previous slide. And, we, and now we have this new tool in Kruger Flow. We need to understand what are the main control on this uh, distribution. And we need to understand if the timing of generation is favorable compared to the trap formation or disturbing event. And what I mean by disturbing event, it's uh, the Messinian salinity crisis, uh, which have a very uh, large impact on the, on the pressure distribution and the, and the risk, uh, the various risk in the basin. So in that case, it's illustrated uh, with, this, uh, with this scheme. And you see that uh, during the first sea level fall, uh, of the Messinian crisis, we have dilatation of gas, but also a risk of fracturation in the seal. Um, then um, a likely gas shrinkage due to the overload of the salt, but still, uh, still some fracturation risk. And then during the droning, uh, a decrease of, uh, of this fracturation risk and so on. So this is important um, for, the, for the understanding of the processes and the timing, but uh, it's a, it has not been uh, uh, studied during this um, this uh, this analysis, but we will go, we will come back to that uh, for some uh, some example I will show. The other question, which is uh, also very important, is to understand the timing of bacterial activity versus uh, the timing of trap formation, depending on uh, on the age and uh, either for the the Tamar equivalent play or for uh, for other plays. So here I put that one in the Miocene, but it could be as well for uh, for the Pliocene or deeper uh, or deeper uh, likely reservoir. So what we need to uh, to understand in that case, it's uh, for this uh, reservoir and seal uh, pairs deposited in the basin. We have to understand uh, how the competition between the trap formation, uh, the peak of uh, bacterial activity, and uh, the end of the bacterial activity uh, when reaching 80 degrees in the system. Are, uh, are occurring. And this will help to place a critical moment for, uh, for the trap and for the trap feeling and, uh, and risk uh, our assets. 
So the study was carried out with uh, those uh, six uh, uncertain parameters in the experimental design, so uh, compaction curve, uh, the, the thermal conductivities of, uh, of the sedimentary phases, uh, the basal heat flow, uh, the surface temperature, and the thickness of uh, two, um, two intervals for the Miocene and the Oligocene. And why did we uh, use those parameters? Because uh, they are supposed to be the most uh, important, the most impacting on uh, the presence or not in the biogenic window as, uh, as it has been defined. So why? Uh, if you consider the thickness uh, at present day, and it can be related as well uh, to the uncertainty you have in the picking or in, in the uncertainty you have on the velocity uh, on, the, on the time to depth conversion, um, so it will impact uh, finally the sedimentation rate uh, at deposition. On the other hand, uh, you have uh, those three parameters, thermal conductivity, basal heat flow and surface temperature, which will have an impact on the thermal gradients. Uh, so surface and, and uh, surface temperature and heat flow, they will tend to increase um, uh, the thermal gradient when increasing and the conductivity as, uh, as uh, the opposite effect. Uh, if you if you replace uh, shale by sand, um, you will uh, you will cool your basin. So and the last one, uh, it's uh, the compaction curve, and the compaction curve will both uh, impact uh, will have an impact on the sedimentation rate because uh, it will change uh, the thickness through time of your uh, of your faces, and it will have also an impact on the on the on the gradient uh, due to the um, to the amount of water you have in the, and, the, and the conductivity associated you have in your sediments. Uh, so with these six parameters, um, we obtained this uh, experimental design. So I, uh, it was uh, 22, but I extended uh, to uh, 27 simulations to, to have uh, the confirmation runs uh, during the analysis. And I choose to apply these laws. So, uh, a normal law for uh, for compaction and heat flow because I uh, assume that uh, we were more likely to be closer to the reference value and the extreme value were, uh, were less likely. Uh, for the conductivity and for the surface temperature, I was not uh, not sure. Uh, um, I, I assume a, a wider range of uh, uncertainty, so I put uh, this uh, triangular law. And for the for the thickness, I I used uh, two different laws. So for the Miocene. Uh, which is uh, better constrained by, uh, by wells in the area. Uh, I assume that we are uh, likely uh, a bit overestimated in terms of thickness or closer to zero. So uh, I uh, skewed this, uh, this curve toward the, the, the smaller values and the Oligocene, it was uh, not clear about the no control on the velocity, con um, velocity conversion. So I assume uh, probably a, a wider uh, incertitude. So now we have we have run that. Uh, so it was quite fast in that case uh, because the model has no uh, was uh, quite small. Uh, we can check uh, the calibration. So um, it was acceptable. Um, and there, as Alcide mentioned before, uh, we need to check this uh, this calibration. And now we we know that. So for the temperature, but also for the maturity data we have in this area. Uh, we can go uh, further into this uh, heating rate analysis. And you see here in the 1D extraction, uh, the, the variation uh, for each cells uh, of the model at the time of deposition. Uh, so we have this interval, which is uh, most interesting, but we also have this one, which can go for very low values or quite close to the lower boundary of the, of the heating rate and rising to, uh, to more favorable values. Um, uh, I'll see also show this kind of, uh, of graph and here we can see, uh, we can directly evidence uh, the main uh, parameters impacting the, um, the, the result of the heating rates. Um, so it's quite evident, but uh, thickness is the most impacting because it's, uh, it's directly playing with the, with the sedimentation rate. But you can see that we also have an impact of on, uh, because of compaction and uh, the thermal conductivity of the sediments. And this is um, probably uh, showing the, um, the variability uh, we, we could have introduced in the, in the facies maps. 
And in the next slides, I will detail uh, analysis for a, a layer in the upper part or in the, in the upper sec section and another one in the lower section. So the first one for the shallow interval, I can, uh, so I, um, I checked first, uh, so uh, it's the same workflow for, uh, for each study, but uh, I will detail first uh, this one and, and go more into uh, uh, specific uh, questions for the, for the next uh, slides. Um, so here, the first thing we have to check is uh, the predictivity and the, and the surface quality, uh, sur response surface quality. So here uh, we are quite happy because it's, uh, well, we are even very happy because uh, the values are, are very high. And as I said uh, before, uh, here we have less predictivity, but it's also where uh, the standard deviation is uh, the lower. So uh, this, is not, uh, this is not a big deal. So knowing that, uh, we can proceed proceed to the next steps and uh, determine uh, the main effect definition. So here in that case, you have uh, you have the values of the so it's a percentage um, of the, the the primary effect of each of the six parameters I used, and you see that the the, the two main ones are uh, the thickness and uh, the compaction curve of the sediments. Um, so in for that interval and and in general for this study there is no need to compute the main uh, effect map because there is no variation i um i put um as an input it was a constant variation so uh, 5 to uh, 5 to 10 or 15 percent variation for each parameters so there is no real reason no no really reason that uh, that there are lateral variation but another very uh, interesting tool uh, of this uh, Cougar Flow new module, it's uh, the estimation panel. And uh, with this estimation panel, you are able to, uh, to, to directly compute uh, the maps um, with a given value. So here I, I, uh, I illustrated variation. So on top, you have the thickness. Uh, below, you have the porosity. And uh, I, I, I try to... I made the variation from the minus one to the plus one uh, values of the simulation initial values. And you can see directly the variations. Uh, so the greener, it's, uh, it's the, the more favorable area. And you can see directly, so if I, if I decrease the thickness, for instance, my best uh, biogenic window is more reduced than if I increase the thickness, or the same if I decrease uh, the porosity uh, I have a smaller, uh, smaller uh, Belgian window rather than if I increase it, and you can also play with the two parameters or even even the, those six parameters if you want. So the main learnings from this uh, first uh, analysis is um, that we have a high variability on the on the presence in the biogenic window in this area, and um, and this is mainly caused uh, by the the facies definition and the uncertainty we have on the facies, uh, but also on the thickness uh, at present day we have for this layer. So from that, uh, we also computed the, those probability maps, so P10, P50, P90, because it's uh, the, the the value we use in total energies, and. Um, now we have this, uh, we can uh, directly derive uh, those probability maps. And I think this is really uh, a, a very good way to illustrate uh, things. Okay, it's, it's quite obvious to, to, to see uh, the biogenic window here. Okay, it's the greener part and here it's bigger. And, and for the P10, it's even bigger. But these uh, probability uh, maps, they are really uh, uh, a very easy way to display those uh, those properties into a, a single uh, a single map. So here you have two extractions. Uh, so the main biogenic window and also uh, um, well the, the the very low uh, fringe of this biogenic window. I just uh, extracted that one as well. Um, and uh, the interest for that uh, and the, the main question for that play was to go to combine this analysis so to know where uh, where is the the biogenic potential and combine that with the timing of uh, pasteurization so here we are uh, checking uh, if we are depositing or if we are active the if the biogenic generation is still active when we start to deposit the seal and when we start to uh, impact 
the basin or uh, the, the the trap filling and the pressure evolution with the biogenic with the methanol crisis sorry uh, which is this uh, this pink uh, shape so in that case you see that um, in uh, in this green part we have been reaching the pasteurization after the onset of uh, salt deposition so it means that uh, when you start depositing the seal you are still uh, generating gas and it's quite uh, it's uh, it's better for the exploration rather than in this part where um, most of the gas is uh, supposed to be lost to the surface and uh, the added value is afterwards that you can combine those two analyses into uh, into one and you see that um, Finally, the main areas with uh, where the two probabilities, uh, the two uh, analyses are, are the more favorable. It's only this uh, small area and it's quite uh, reduced. Um, and in particular, because it includes also this lower uh, fringe of the biogenic window. So in that case, there is a poor overlap and uh, the timing is, uh, is not really favorable for, uh, for the prospectivity in this area. Um, so the the analysis for a second area. So here I don't show uh, all the the process before reaching this P uh, ten, P fifty, P ninety maps, uh, but it's the same exercise. So we can compute uh, the probability of being uh, in the biogenic window at the time of deposition. And here uh, you see that we are quite uh, favorable throughout uh, this area. And in that case, because we are in a deeper uh, layer, it's uh, less uh, the, the Messinian crisis is less critical. So we just need to uh, to have uh, an efficient seal uh, at the time of the peak of bacterial activity. And when when you combine the two analyses, you see that uh, most of this uh, deep layer is in a, is in a favorable uh, window for uh, for the probabilities high to find uh, uh, an efficient biogenic generation and uh, uh, before the seal deposition. So in that case, uh, we, can, uh, we can evidence that the timing is not, uh, is not an issue with, uh, for, for, this, uh, for this layer. Um, and, and what we use uh, as well for, uh, with this model, it's a, an upside evaluation and we try to work on the thermogenic uh, system. So if you don't know this paper, this quite recent paper about uh, um, a review on uh, the, the source rock and, and, the, and the thermogenic potential in Eratosthenes cement, it shows that you have an excellent potential for, uh, for a Bartonian to pre and source rock in, um, in this part of the basin. So what we will check now is uh, it's uh, for the corresponding uh, layer in our model if uh, the maturity uh, is favorable or not. So you have here directly the, this analysis, and you see that for this uh, this model, uh, so in the P90, so it's exactly the same parameters. It's uh, still the same experimental design. You see that the maturity can vary from the early oil window to um, to the late oil window, and uh, even uh, well, quite close to the gas uh, window in some of the layers here in or some or of the these areas here in the in the border. So the same, we can uh, we can extract the probability uh, of reaching a, a threshold to uh, have enough enough maturity, enough generation to expel hydrocarbon. So here, in that case, we don't have data geochemical data in the basin, so it's it's purely uh, related uh, to um, to analogs uh, in terms of uh, of social quality and. Uh, and we we see that in most of these parts, uh, in most of these. Uh, area in the basin, we, we should be able to, to have an efficient expulsion, except where it's immature to the right. Um, and finally, if we want to define some, uh, some best pro prospectivity areas, we can uh, combine this analysis for, for this deep layer with um, this, the, the analysis we did on the, on the biogenic system. So here you have uh, the results from the previous slide, so the, both the timing and the presence. And if you combine that, you have this uh, resulting map, and uh, we can evidence uh, several uh, sweet spot area uh, where both uh, biogenic and thermogenic uh, systems are favorable. Um, so, in terms of conclusions, uh, with this new tool uh, developed in Kruger Flow, uh, so we have been able to uh, introduce uh, more uncertainty in the grid and uh, and do the analysis in um, 
uh, in several in several properties. So um, what is really important is that we also can introduce uh, uncertainty on the geometry through the thickness and the compaction curve. But I could also have used uh, some erosion if needed, or or some bathymetry variation through time if needed as well. Um, the analysis has been done in uh, in classical temp uh, properties such as the temperature or the maturity, but also some uh, post-processing ones. So for people more familiar with Temis flow, it's uh, what uh, what is given by Groovy. Um, and we have been uh, identifying the the most impacting parameters in the different areas, uh, compute the maps uh, for for given value and and um, and variation through the initial range, uh, delineate the kitchens and uh, and combine the analysis. And this is really something uh, really useful uh, because. Uh, you can define the, the, the best places to, uh, to focus your, your exploration if you want to meet uh, several criteria. Uh, so the feedback, uh, so as usual, uh, and, and in that case, in particular, because you have uh, plenty of simulations, uh, well, it's better to launch that uh, at night or during the weekend. But, uh, but in the end, the, the map analysis and the tool is very easy to use. You just have to click on uh, and follow the workflow and. Uh, and you are guided uh, in, the, in the tool, so it's very easy to use. And uh, the final word is for, for the teams in, uh, in Bessie Front Lab, uh, because uh, they have been developing this, uh, this tool last year. Uh, we, it was a lockdown time, and, uh, and they started, uh, they managed to, to, to do the job uh, within uh, six months and, uh, and implement that in, uh, in the software very rapidly. So uh, thank you all, and, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Pierre-Yves. Thanks to you for accepting our invitation to speak as well. And thanks for, for this presentation, of course. So we have a few questions for you. Uh, the first one is from Ainoura. What is the type of reservoir uh, you, you have there for biogenic gas accumulation? So here we were looking at the classics. Then we have a question from Hugo. Uh, Hugo Kumo from Shell, are you assu assuming only one type of bacteria, mesophile versus thermophile? Um, in that case, there, we, we didn't uh, run generation and so on. So we just uh, check if we, it was possible to be in the, in the biogenic uh, window as it is defined, but, uh, but there is no, uh, no work done in this uh, bacterial characterization. Do you want to add something I said on that? Uh, sorry, I was putting my headphones. I missed, uh, I missed uh, the, the, the question. question on sorry, the, sorry. On the I think, you know, as I was saying also, uh, uh, re, uh, I was writing to you ago. We, we, indeed, in Temis, there is also a full module for biogenic gas uh, simulation, so generation, migration, dissolution, and, and so on. And in that case, we consider both type of uh, bacteria. Yes. Uh, but uh, from uh, what uh, we know, the mesophyll bacteria do most of the most of the work. Another question from from Hugo Pierre Yves: Are you looking at the heating rate from onset of sedimentation all the way to beginning of pasteurization window, or just at the deposition age, because biogenic activity could catch up? Yes, uh, no, actually we are, uh, I presented only the sedimentation uh, at, at the time of deposition, um, but uh, we are evaluating uh, through time until the pasteurization. But it's our secret, uh, <laughs> secret formula. <laughs> um, thanks. Then we have a question more, more let's say, more uh, Kuga flow related from uh, Ranajit. Can these probability values uh, example on transformation ratio, timing, expulsion, etc., can be directly used as risk attribute for POS estimation. Yes, uh, I, I don't know if the question is more for Pierre or for me, but um, both of you, I guess. I guess you are all the, you are both. Yes, the, no, no, <laughs> yes, of course. The, so you actually the, it depends on how you want to to see your information. So from the through the Kruger flow approach, so you have your your 10,000 samples that are thrown, and then the information can be either translated into percentile maps, so P10, P15, uh, P90 values, or probability maps, which are probability of success. Of course, your success depends on the criteria you impose. 
but you can uh, of course check how many simulations within your your answer for your objective uh, respond to your uh, success criteria and and then it depends of course in within your, your company how you translate that but these probability of success maps could be presented as such or translated into uh, composite uh, CRS maps, composite risk maps, or any other type of uh, valuable information you, you, you want to use. Thanks, Afsid. Uh, we have another question from uh, Ainura, which is more related to the biogenic gas workflow in, in general. Uh, is biogenic gas uh, generation is biogenic gas, let's say, goes direct, so, sorry, stays in situ in the source rock or migrates from a kitchen? So uh, both have, are possible depending on your source rock characteristic, on your, let's say, organic rich uh, layers characteristic, characteristics. Um, if you run the real, uh, the real generate, uh, sorry, biogenic gas module, you will simulate the generation of gas and potential migration to upper, upper, upper layers uh, if, uh, if the context uh, allows it. Uh, so we have a, another question from uh, Cosm, Cosme. Have you applied this methodology for biogenic thermogenic, not only ge for generation, but also for migration? Uh, so for me, no, uh, not yet, but uh, I know that uh, you, you guys in basic, you have done that uh, and you presented that in the user meeting. So. Yes, indeed. It's... Indeed. So um, in this uh, work uh, from this work from Pierre was done before uh, we released the full biogenic gas module in tennis. So at the time and the purpose of this study was more in, uh, uh, a study on a uh, if there is a biogenic gas potential, uh, what are the chances of generation and preservation of this gas? Uh, but uh, if you, uh, well, so I guess one of your future work, uh, Pierre, will be to, to run the, the module and to, to see and to have the mm -hmm. same kind of study, not only on generation, but also on migration, of course. Yeah, and coupling with thermogenic, and, uh, but also for thermogenic only, it's, uh, we also use that and it's very, uh, very interesting. The results are very, uh, it's very new to, to, to see that in, uh, in our studies. Right, thanks. Wow. All right, I think we, we reached the end. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for attending this meeting. Before you go, please enter the two questions uh, in the polls panel. That would be helpful. And uh, we have a last question. <laughs> we have a last question, Thierry, from Faisal. Can biogenic generation and biodegradation simultaneously happen in the same layer, so below 80 degrees? Uh, well, I've never heard about that, but... Uh, Be very you, low reactivity. Yeah, it means that uh, you are, at the same time, uh, have a, you have an efficient migration through, through to this reservoir and generation in the source rock uh, in the same place. In, not sure it's very likely to uh, to expect that but, uh... it could the conditions are are gathered um okay well thank you everyone and uh bye bye see you next time so as i said at the beginning we will uh, we will share the video of the recording for everyone so for those who missed the first part because the screen was too small you'll have a full uh, uh, full screen uh, view uh, of this uh, of what acid presented Thank you, everyone, and bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye. See bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.